Just outside Bellingen, on the New South Wales mid-north coast, single mum Kyla Jobson is packing up her life. It's kind of hard. I keep going through like excited that we're out of it because a lot of it, the mould and things inside I was worried about for my kids and the baby, but I'm a bit upset because you just don't know where I'm going. You want to say goodbye to your granddad? See you later, eh? Kiss. Good girl. <laughs> Good way. Say goodbye. Yeah, stand up now. Good girl. 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 So you're not going in there. At the start of the year with all of the rain just at the just before all the massive floods, <clears throat> I noticed that there were like bubbles popping up in the ceiling and you could tell that it had been leaking and then destroyed my son's bed. Every time it rains it just leaks straight through. So me and both the kids have all been sleeping just in my room for the last four months because I can't guarantee it's not going to rain halfway through the night and I just can't, can't have my kids in here if it's like this, so. The owner had already told Kyla they wanted to put the rent up. They didn't fix the mould or the leaking roof. All of that's going in the bin. Kyla gave notice, thinking with five months till the end of the lease, she'd be able to find a property. You're still playing with that. Like so many places across Australia, rental prices here have skyrocketed. And start getting that done. Kyla says she has unsuccessfully applied for dozens of properties. The only thing I've been able to think of that kind of describes it is like feeling like you're drowning and every single time you can see the surface and you feel like you're just about to break the surface, something grabs your ankle and rips you back down and you've got to try all over again to get back up to that light. But, I mean, the kids are definitely worth it, aren't they? It's just exhausting. Yes. Having a job in Australia is no longer a guarantee you'll have a house. Despite working six days a week to support her family, Kyla Jobson no longer has a place to call home. And it just feels like you're going in a circle. All I want is for you guys to have somewhere nice and safe. When she leaves this house tonight, Kyla and her kids are moving into a motel room. Caden, are you ready to quickly, quickly run? Your feet will get wet. OK, well, Mummy will come back for this stuff then, hey? My head is in too. OK, are you going to hold that? Now, Mum's going to lift you up. This is the new face of homelessness in Australia. The critical lack of affordable and public housing means in towns like this, even if you have a job, there is often simply nowhere to live. In this episode of Four Corners, decay of the Australian housing dream. This used to be the sort of place that people on low to middle incomes could reasonably expect to find a home. It's not anymore. We investigate what went wrong.
It's the morning rush at Pete's Place, a drop-in centre in Coffs Harbour. We have a facility where people can grab a bite to eat, have a bit of a rest, have a shower, do their washing. We've got a lot of support staff here so we can work with people on rental applications or finding housing. We have a whole lot of meals that are donated each week so people can come in and grab a feed. We also have a lot of families that are experiencing um, rental stress that will come in and stock up on food as well so they don't have to decide whether to eat or pay their rent. Pete's place is ground zero when it comes to homelessness in this region. When we first opened in 2018, we were seeing about 20 people a day come through the service. Four years later, we're seeing around 80 people a day. We're seeing a lot more families, people with children, people with disabilities, um, our older Australians as well. We're seeing a lot more people that we would have been able to move out of homelessness quite quickly a few years ago and we're no longer able to do that. What's it like for you, you know, seeing this tide of people coming in who have nowhere to live? You know, I think when people come in and they say to us, oh, I've just gone into crisis accommodation and my heart sinks because I know that as much as we're going to sit with you and do everything we can to support you and we're going to apply for those hundred rentals with you, we may not have an outcome and that's terrifying for them and I think it's really, really sad. Let's have a look. We'll go price. What are we saying, your maximum? 400, they say, is my maximum. Right. Jessica was working in a bakery when the owner of her rental property decided to renovate and gave her notice. This one's in town, two bedroom. Yeah, 320. 320. That's good. Jessica, how many of these properties have you actually applied for so far? I roughly do about 10 a week. About 10, yeah. So how many in total? Oh, I've been, so probably in between 50 and 60, because it's been about five or six weeks now that I've applied for every week. Yeah, and no luck whatsoever? No. Jessica was entitled to 28 days crisis accommodation, but that's now expired. There was no vacancies in town. They only have two motels they said that they use in Coffs Harbour and they didn't have any. So it was a phone call to my sister. Um, she works full time and she lives above a pub. Um, and so children aren't allowed above a pub, but there was no choice. It was, yeah, um, so I slept in the back of her car that night and my son slept upstairs. How old's he? He's nine. How is that as a mum? It's scary to not know what's gonna happen the next day. So where um, are you sleeping now? Um, I've paid for uh, my own accommodation um, out at the Caribbean Park. Um, it's the cheapest place I could get. A cabin? Or? Uh, yes, a cabin, yes, small cabin. Um, that's, yep, $110 a night, so... And that's the cheapest in, in town. So while you're... Jessica can't afford to keep paying close to $800 a week for a cabin. If you don't get a place over the next few days, what happens to you and your son? Well, essentially, he'll go with my sister over night time. I'm either... If it's possible in the back of her car, but if not, I've got a tent and a swag that provided by Pete's place to sleep in, which that's scary. <laughs> Could you have ever imagined that you'd end up living in a tent? No. No. The scary thing is, hmm. is that I don't want to lose my boy. A simple thing of not being able to house my son could, there, there could be that, or that incident, like that, that he could be, go I could lose my son. And, and that's, not, that's not fair when I've raised him, so, so, sorry, I've raised him solely. And, um, and to and work so hard and to get so far and to have everything gone from underneath you, I could not bear lose him. And you'd be losing him because you don't to, have Yeah, no, house. Not, not for my own, own, um, own choices. Not because right. you're a bad mum. No, it's because I solely couldn't 
there is no housing, there is no, there's, and to, to go through every avenue to try and get nothing. We've got a new Prime Minister who grew up in public housing, who has some understanding of what it's like to be in this situation. What would you say to him? Help us. Help us do something to, to, to help the low income earners and the, the unemployed and the, get stable housing and just help us. We need help. Someone needs to do something for us. Coffs Harbour are these makeshift campsites where people who have nowhere else to go are forced to live in tents. So this is one of our hot spots. This is nice and secluded and we'll quite often have people of a night time that will come down here and camp. They'll get down here late night and then they'll move on early, early morning before the beach walkers and things like that start. And we'll quite often have people camping in the bush here as well. Sarah Borrett from not-for-profit agency New Horizons is doing a drive around the rough sleeping campsites in the area. The best bet is she says the people leave the during the day place. to avoid being moved on or fined by rangers. They just quite simply can't afford the rent that their weekly rent's been put up to. And so they've got nowhere else to go but to sleep in a tent or in a car. Anyone sleeping in a car is always at risk of violence, people breaking into their cars, people trying to steal their cars and things like that. Today she's heading to a local camping store. I've spoken to them previously about buying bulk supplies for the homeless community and we're picking up some solar battery packs. Hi, good, how are you? Sarah Borrett's main job used to be about getting people into homes. Now it's about tents. I also wanted to talk to you guys about tents. We're handing them out to people that are sleeping rough and things like that because we just can't get them accommodation. Do you have anything like that at the moment? Yeah, yeah, I can show you down here. Yep, no. okay. is that right there? Yeah, that's yep. fine. There. Perfect. So in 2011, when I started with New Horizons, the housing market was very different to what it is now. There was very much an off-peak season and an on-peak season. So the off-peak season would be in winter and we would get people housed in cheap accommodation, really reasonable rents at the drop of a hat. Basically, real estates were crying out for people to move into these places so landlords didn't have vacancies. We were getting people housed back in the beginning, 30 people a month. Now we're lucky if we do maybe 10. An affordable rental has become all but a pipe dream in Coffs Harbour. Rental vacancy rates this winter stayed at an impossibly low 1.5%. By contrast, a decade ago, they were 5%. Around the country, vacancy rates are the lowest they've ever been. It's never been this hard to find a home. It's at the point now where we know that it's going to be a very long process for these people, so we're actually giving them tents. That's pretty much what it's come down to. There's lots of people sleeping in the cars as well. She says those who do have housing are often taking in extended family. Overcrowding is a massive issue here. We'll quite often have whole families living in households. When I say families, I mean extended families, so aunties, uncles, grandmas, grandpas um, and kids and things like that.
This isn't just a story about Coffs Harbour. There are towns like this across the nation, sea change and tree change destinations, where pressures like lack of affordable housing, COVID migration and properties being swallowed up by the Airbnb market mean there's a dire lack of homes to rent. And that means that prices just keep going up. In the year to August, rental prices in Australia rose 10%, a new record high. Weekly rents in Coffs Harbour have gone up by more than $100 over the past two years. That's almost double the rate of the rest of New South Wales. I think people are just making a different lifestyle choice. They're realising that they can work remotely and so they can choose their destination as far as where they would like to live. And Coffs Harbour's just seemed to be a lot of people's selection. And I guess it came down to originally it's more affordable. The rise in demand for rental properties for real estate agents like Lisa Hanlon really took off in the first year of the COVID pandemic. And this property here is... Now, Every listing attracts a large stack of applications. This person here has had good long-term employment with his current company, which is always of benefit. On a sort of a day-to-day -day basis, what is the impact of this in terms of people who are on lower incomes and trying to find properties here? They're really struggling, so genuine people are applying for rental properties. They may have good references, they may have income, but they're being declined because there's 20 other applications and someone else is being successful and they're not. So it is quite distressing for people. So she's got good rental history? They're genuine people who need accommodation. We've found that we've had doctors, nurses, other professions come into town looking for accommodation to secure their new placements here. If they haven't been, haven't been able able to find accommodation, quite often they have to pass up that opportunity. But most affected are lower paid workers. The most recent data on housing stress in Coffs Harbour found only 3.1% of homes here are affordable for people on a low income. And of those, the majority were one bedroom units. If you're on a low income in Coffs Harbour and can't find an affordable private rental, public housing isn't really an option either. The wait list here for a government home, one of the longest in New South Wales, is more than 10 years. Despite the desperate need for these homes, many of them are sitting empty. Local disability worker Stacey Warne is taking us on a tour of the estate where she lives with her four children and her dad. Most of these homes are social housing. So this house here has been empty for at least eight months. It's another three bedroom house, you know, it's got a good backyard, all the things that we all need as a family. And um, yeah, nothing's been done to it. I'm not sure it's had any damage or anything like that, but yeah, it's still empty, so that's really sad. Dee Dee. Many of the roofs have such bad leaks, the residents have resorted to tying tarpaulins over them to keep the rain out. Every time it rains, they still have damage coming through that. Across here, we've got an empty house. It's been empty for about, oh, God knows how long now. And it just gets left like this, you know? It just gets empty, doesn't even get cleaned. For those that are lived in, many are run down and overcrowded. This is family of six, and they're living in a, a three-bedroom place. What they classify as a small three-bedroom house. Yeah, yeah. So all three kids, being two boys and one girl, are, are, are crammed in one tiny room. There are two of them additional needs. Um, well, we've got a lot of problems with this house, so yeah. it's horrible. We can only get one hot shower a day. There's six of us in the house. The roof's falling in at the back. Our backyard floods, it doesn't drain. 
Uh, we get maggots because the sewage comes up all through the backyard. Uh, there's holes in the floor, which the last one we had took up half of our room and it was six to eight months before it got fixed. Mm. Nothing we can do about it. It's a roof over our head. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how we all have to, we all have to look at it. Because we ring maintenance, nothing happens. Then if we get, if we look into getting things done about it, we get in trouble for, for fixing it. So we just have to deal with it. Stacey Warne has a lot of pluck. She has a stable job and is desperately trying to get out. She says she's applied unsuccessfully for dozens of private rental properties. I'm getting to that stage in my life where I can maybe hop out of social housing and let someone else that really needs it come in. But it doesn't matter what I do, I've, I've gone and I've gotten a job. I work three days a week now and the other three days I do, I do community work. And not only do I enjoy doing my community work that I uh, out, like helping, um, I want to be noticed by another level of society to, to, for someone to see that I'm, I'm trying to better my life and I just feel like being a single mum of four kids, I just feel like I get looked at and I get characterised and it's really unfair considering I try really hard to get out of that. And um, like I'm a disability support worker and um, three of my clients at the moment are also homeless and they come to me and they say, what can we do? And I, I send them on all the avenues, but deep down in my heart, I know that if I've got no hope, Neither do they, and it's really sad because we're we're together. We're just walking along this journey where it feels like there's no there's no solution, and it doesn't matter how how many support letters you get, how, what you have behind your back. You know what? I've even got savings. I've tried my hardest to save as much as I can, and it doesn't make any difference. It's just being in social housing. It's like you're stuck here. In the centre of Coffs Harbour is what's known as the Argyle Estate. The estate currently has 129 social housing homes and 68 privately owned properties. Local Aboriginal elder Yvette Pacey is an advocate for some of the residents in the estate. The majority of them comprise of Indigenous housing, non-Indigenous housing and homeowners. These are families that have been well established, that have lived here for quite a long time, that have raised families in this area, that consider this area their home. They've had families, children, grandchildren, extended families that have all lived within this area, but more importantly benefited from living here. But these homes are set to be demolished and rebuilt under a New South Wales housing scheme, Communities Plus, which only requires developers to include 30% social housing in their plans. Under that model, the new precinct is expected to create 254 extra private homes, but only nine additional social housing properties. Residents haven't been told where they'll be housed while development takes place. We have over a 10 year waiting list for social housing in Coffs Harbour. Just in saying that, if people are transitioning from their homes, where do you relocate them whilst they're waiting for their new home to be built? If we're already experiencing housing shortages and accommodation shortages within our own community, um, how is that going to impact on them if they're not given any time frames for how long they have to wait for their new home? These changes um, that are being proposed are already having a significant impact on people's mental health, their anxiety, uh, they're confused about what future they're going to have. Narelle has raised her children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren on the Argyle estate since 1997. So this yeah. is home for this, your family? This is my home, yep. My home, my grandkids' home. And I've been here for all that, all them years. I just can't leave. I can't. I no, don't no. want to leave. And the area, I know everyone here, they're all beautiful people and we all sort of stick together. What do you know about this development 
that's happening? Well, they have sent out letters, but some letters I can't really understand. Have they given you any indication when this area is being redeveloped, no. where you will go in the meantime? No. No. Now, what if they put us into uh, a motel and they're doing all this? How do we know how long we're going to stay there for? How do we know where we're going to go next? Mm, yes. You know, yes. it's it's um, confusing, you know what I mean? What's the feeling, like, when you think about the fact that this is all going to change? Like, what's the it's emotional...? Hurtful. Very hurtful. Yeah because I can't see myself leaving here because there's too many memories. You know, there's too many memories. Yeah. And I, I, I wouldn't really like to leave. Come this way, whee! <laughs> you get this way? <laughs> you got no shoes on. Mm. Tia is also helping bring up her grandchildren on the Argyle estate. <laughs> There are going to be more than twice as many houses on this estate, but only nine more public homes in a situation where people are waiting as long as you did yeah. to get one of those homes. Well, it's not right. It should be the other way around. If they're building anything and going to knock down a public housing, then they need to be replaced with extra public housing. How does that make you feel that there will only be nine more houses? Oh, robable. Robable. Um, that's not what we are as Australians. Um, that's my bathroom in there. Tia has mental health issues and was on the social housing list for 12 years before finally getting this home eight years ago. <laughs> if they make this decision, are you going to go? No. They'll have to cut me out. I probably would do something so stupid. I don't know. I'm just not going anywhere. This is, I waited a long time. I've gone through too much in life. If I'm not here to help with my grandchildren and help my daughter through this, things don't always work out the way we dream when we're young. And, and to have your parents know that you, to know you can go home, mum and dad's there or mum or dad or whatever, is it's like everything. So yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Not without a fight. Without this fight. The Coffs Harbour City Council has been trying to get answers from the New South Wales Land and Housing Corporation about what the future looks like for residents like Tia and Narell. At the Argyle development itself, currently you've got about 60% of that development is social housing. It's not dysfunctional, it's not a problem area, there's people living happily there that have been there for decades. I just think that we could have more than 30% social housing there. Council wrote to Land and Housing Corporation, New South Wales Government, about particularly whether there'd be any additional social housing in the Argyle Estate redevelopment. And their answer was that they'd try to maintain the current level of social housing. No commitment that there'd be more social housing. Councillor Tony Judge is shocked that so many extra homes are planned on the Argyle estate with so little provision for social housing. Well, there's no criteria going to be issued to market to say this has to be affordable housing and no guarantee that the people who are dislocated by this development will be relocated in coughs. How would you characterise that decision? I think it's been missold to the people in Coffs Harbour. I think people in Coffs Harbour are looking at that redevelopment thinking this is affordable housing. My assessment of it is that it's not. It's, this is a release of currently public land to developers to do with what they will, basically. The New South Wales Land and Housing Corporation would not confirm to Four Corners how many social housing homes would be in the new Argyle development. It also could not say where the residents would be relocated to, but it did confirm that all profits from the sale would be invested into creating more social housing within the area. How many social houses do you estimate that Coffs Harbour needs? To really deal with the problem, it would be in the thousands, but, but a start would be somewhere in the hundreds. If we could just 
get moving. Uh, this is something that's been so neglected. For the last 20 years, I believe, there's been a 25% increase in Australia's population and a 9% increase in social housing. We're going out the back door. Uh, people have got nowhere to live. People now on, on income, we've got working poor people in Australia that can't afford a home. A world away from the housing crisis in Coffs Harbour, we go to a much grander place to meet the person who has the capacity to make change. All right, here we are. We are indeed. <laughs> Unlike most politicians, Federal Housing Minister Julie Collins has an understanding of what it's like to live in social housing. It's um, something I've always been passionate about. Uh, like the Prime Minister, you know, spent my early childhood in Broadacre Public Housing, so it matters. It matters a lot to me. Ms Collins returned to the housing portfolio after nine years in opposition to find that there are towns just as stressed as Coffs Harbour around the country. We're miles behind the eight ball. Uh, the former government clearly didn't do enough when it came to getting more stock of social and affordable houses on the ground. Uh, it clearly didn't work with state and territory ministers enough. Uh, when we had our meeting of housing ministers in July, it was the first meeting in almost five years, which tells you how far behind the eight ball we are. To that end, her government has promised a building program of social and affordable homes. So we went to the last election with a very ambitious uh, policy and a broad policy when it comes to housing. Uh, what we've got is uh, 30,000 social and affordable homes from the Housing Australia Future Fund uh, that we want to uh, get up and running. But ahead of the last election, the Australian Council of Social Services and 70 housing and homelessness stakeholders appealed to all political parties to say Australia needs to build roughly 25,000 homes every year to fill the desperate backlog. So you say that your plan is ambitious, but even putting together what the states are doing and what your government is going to be doing, it's still about a third of what's required. Well, obviously, we all need to be working together, and that's what having a national housing and homelessness plan is. It's also about other people in the sector, the construction sector, the superannuation funds, to try and get more affordable homes on the ground quickly. So shouldn't that 30,000 figure be three times that then? Well, we've got the constraints also in the, sec in the construction sector. Um, you know, we need to be able to build homes as fast as we can. That's what we're going to do. We've been in Coffs Harbour where nurses and disability workers and retail workers and cleaners, working Australians with families, are homeless, are couch surfing, are living in dilapidated housing. How is that acceptable and what are those people supposed to do in the meantime before all of this is rolled out? Yeah, it is. It's heartbreaking. I've been hearing those stories myself. Uh, I've been a member of parliament now for 13 years. I've never had so many people come to my electorate office as I have in the last 12 months with similar stories. And they're heartbreaking and they're really distressing for the people involved. Um, and we're trying to move as quickly as we can. Until things drastically change in regions like this around the country, people like Kyla Jobson will be forced to live in motels. Yeah, well, you can run if you want to. Be careful. We're going to have to go down this way. You going to hold my hand? OK. When we catch up with her again in Bellingen, just down the road from Coffs Harbour, Kyla says she's applied unsuccessfully for a hundred properties. Okay. One, two, three. It's just ridiculous. And then the ones that do come up now, there's two bedroom houses that I remember five years ago 
being advertised for three fifty a week, and now they're six fifty, seven hundred a week, and it's like I walked through that house like I. And I how much do you earn a week? Um, on about seven fifty after tax. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit dark down there. It's okay. She's living in a room behind the tavern where she's a cleaner and works at the bar. You don't have to be scared. No, we're here now. Her boss is helping her out with a cheaper room rate, giving her three months to find a place. Don't wander off. Don't disappear. So don't disappear, you've got to stay in here. I don't want to stay here. When I was younger, my family we lived kind of rougher and when my mum and dad split up, me and my siblings were all homeless with my mum for about eight months. And we actually lived in the same motel for a few months while we were trying to find a place. And I remember being in the motel room and just like swearing if I had kids, there was no way I'd ever be in that position and do anything I could. And I've, ugh, I've had to apologise to my mum so many times because now I realise she was just trying so hard to just have somewhere safe for us and get us a house. And it wasn't anything she'd done wrong or anything. It was just the situation we were in. So it did make me feel really sick thinking I'd been doing all these things to get my kids in a place that was better than what me and my brothers and sisters had. And then it, it just all kind of crumbled and I felt really, really crap that I, I just, oh, that I had to like constantly reassure my son that this is just a new adventure, like that was the main thing and then I had to try and make out like I was really excited myself that we're just going to live at mummy's work now and then that means you get to be at mummy's work when I'm here instead of me being gone all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to be working for very long. Won't be for long. I'm so super quick. I promise it won't be long, okay? Super duper quick. I'll be right there. It's okay. You want to help me? You can help me another time, yeah? It's okay. Hey, it's all right. I know. Shh. Yep, you can sit in the spare room. No. Jesus. That way I can hear you. Watch out, watch your toes. Are you going to sit on the floor for me so Mummy can help? Get all the laundry with Pitta? No, no. Yeah, there's no lounge at the moment. You can sit on the lounge when Mummy goes behind the bar, yeah? <laughs> okay. All right, you just play with Alex for one minute while Mummy runs up the hallway and helps Pitta get the laundry. <coughs> oh, God. What is the practical impact of not having a home? Everything. We've only got the microwave and the fridge and the toaster and kettle so that's what I've got to work around for the kids meals or buy something at the moment. Alex. I'm constantly on edge especially in the middle of the night with Alex still being so young because she'll wake up and cry and I'm worried that it's going to frustrate paying hotel customers which will then complain which will then not only affect where I'm staying but my job because I work here. I don't want anything to go wrong or anything to seem like we're annoying or an inconvenience or anything in any way because I'm just so on edge. I already don't have a house. If I then lost my job, there would be no... There would be nothing. Outside the tavern, gentrified Bellingen is pumping. A new breed of locals sip lattes, browse artisan homewares, try on nice clothes. While more and more of the people on lower wages 
who keep this town going have nowhere to live. Rents went up in the Bellingen area by 48% in the year to December 2021, the highest increase in New South Wales. For context, that's three times the average rent rise in regional Australia in the same period, and 16 times higher than the increase in capital cities. It's starting to get a bit overwhelming, but it's just, you've just got to push through it. It's just, there's no other choice, really. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I end up laying there. Last night I was so tired, and yet I know I still laid there for at least an hour and a half just trying to think of what, okay, so the next day, what are we going to do the next day? I'm just not letting myself feel anything too much because then I'll just break down, I won't be able to handle it, and the kids need me to be able to be on top of my game right now. So I'll schedule a mental breakdown for later in the year. <laughs> this little family is not asking for much. What does your experience right now, the raw truth of it, make you think about this country? It just sucks. I don't want a handout or anything. It feels crap. Like, I feel like I'm a good person. I don't break the law. I work all the time. I'll help anyone, anytime, anywhere. All I just want is somewhere for me and the kids to be able to call our home. I want people to understand that it's not sustainable to be able to live like this and it's just impossible like it's really impossible something needs to happen where there's not so many people in this position because it's yeah too much <laughs> 